unfamiliar with you, please just uh, tell us your name, uh, a little bit about your background, and, and really what you've been doing for the last several years. So my name is Danny Kennedy, and I am the Chief Energy Officer, the CEO of the New Energy Nexus, which is a network of incubators and accelerators and funds around the world that supports diverse entrepreneurs to drive innovation and build equity into the global clean economy. So we basically back startups, we provide human and financial capital to help them succeed. And I'm the managing director of something called the California Clean Energy Fund, which really was the uh, precursor to the whole global new energy nexus. That is a $25 million fund in California, um, which we manage as a nonprofit for the state to help California meet its pretty aggressive energy goals around 100% renewable electricity by 2045, 100% electric vehicle bus fleets by 2030-ish, and other key parts of the plan there. Uh, and we're really replicating a lot of the experience in California to go solar and wind and electric vehicle and to electrify buildings and trying to bring a lot of the learnings and know-how from that experience to the rest of the states and around the world with the new energy nexus. I've got a background of being an entrepreneur myself, having done a number of startups, uh, solar businesses, finance businesses in the solar space, incubators as private entities uh, and other things. And before all that, um, seems like a lifetime ago, but uh, last century, I guess, in the 20th century, I was an activist working around climate and energy issues with Greenpeace and other nonprofits and have been basically in this space for 25, 30 years, seen the transition happen, um, helped it happen in some places, and I'm very excited about the opportunity we have to achieve one of the preconditions, I think, to greater social justice and sustainability, which is the adoption of 100% clean energy for 100% of the population. Tell us what your book is about, Rooftop Revolution, how solar power can save our economy and our planet from dirty energy. Well, I actually wrote Rooftop Revolution a number of years ago, but it's still somewhat relevant today in that it predicted that a kind of burst of resistance to the powers that be that would be manifest in the adoption of solar by homes and businesses in the US and around the world would drive the costs down of photovoltaics and the scaling of solar power through photovoltaics to such a degree that it becomes the inevitable power system of choice for the world. And that indeed is where we're at in 2019 as the year starts. We're in a situation where there is no lower cost way of creating the thing we call electricity. It is now perceived not only as the cleanest option and the fastest one to build and the most modular and adaptable to different loads and demands, but the lowest cost. And low cost things win market share, basically. Ultimately, they will crush all their competition. And so really that that phenomenon that we will experience in the coming decades of an S-curve of adoption where it goes through this ramp uh, until it's at saturation of the market um, is upon us. That's what I call the solar ascent. And so the rooftop revolution was about the early years of this longer term evolution of the economy to 100% solar powered, which sounds a little crazy even to some of my renewable energy friends. but. I think if you look at it rationally, you know, this civilization, we've had, you know, fossil fuels and electricity for a couple hundred years. I'm saying that within a hundred, and, and many pundits would agree, even Shell Oil and others would say this, we will be predominantly powered by solar uh, and, you know, perhaps entirely powered by solar because nothing will be able to compete. And what that opens up is a world of abundance and opportunity, actually, where the system of electricity, which can actually power our lifestyles and lives and industry and businesses and commerce, uh, that electricity can all come from a clean source, falling fresh from the sky every morning as the sun comes around the planet. And uh, we can tap that evenly around the earth. You know, it's not held under the feet of a few, as is in the case of coal and oil and gas. It can't be concentrated by capital in the same ways um, that coal, oil and gas was and has been to the influence and, and betterment of just a few um, as per the history of the robber barons of this state of New York and you know the Koch brothers and others like the Saudi royal family. Um, so we can get away from those years and, and put power in the hands of the people literally and figuratively with solar as it rises. 
So it's a pretty um, big deal, a transformation. Uh, it's not without its challenges. It's not easy. It requires innovation. It requires us to be intentional about the outcome so that we do share the joy and the benefits and the jobs and the leadership and the ownership of it with people who have historically been left out of energy uh, industries and opportunities. Uh, and that's what we do with New Energy Nexus, actually, is we focus on getting new entrepreneurs in, more diverse and inclusive communities offered the chance to take part in this huge boon that is coming uh, and that will also happen to, as I say in the subtitle of the book, save the planet from itself and, and climate change along the way. There are some people that are saying that in order to build out the solar and wind infrastructure, it would be so energy intensive that it nullifies any benefit we get from wind and solar. What do you think of what they're saying? The, the idea that it nullifies it just isn't really right. I get that there's a concern about the inputs and that there's a, a, a challenge to ensure we are paying back the energy input that is required to create the things. And we track that very closely in the solar industry and the photovoltaic panels have come down from a, a 10 or 12 year payback to a three year payback. There's a very um, good body of literature on energy uh, return on investment, basically the energy that comes out of the energy invested. And you know we have long surpassed now fossil fuels, partly because the fossil fuel industry is going to the more extreme extraction ends of the universe, you know, the, the tar sands of Canada and the heavy oils of Venezuela and the fracking fields of America. And these things mean that you intentionally create a lot more or use a lot more energy to get those barrels of oil and tons of gas out of the ground. Whereas with photovoltaics, we become more efficient and with scale for each unit of energy produced put less in on a ratio. And as I say, that pays back now in every two to three years on the photovoltaic panels. It's not to say it's not a concern and, and we need to look at the closed loop nature of production, the possibility to recycle all the materials that go into it. And, and with the scaling of this industry, there will be real constraints on materials, particularly not so much for silicon, which is sand of a kind, but for lithium, cobalt, the ingredients that go into batteries, which are becoming critical to the whole transition and we have to manage for that and plan for that and do differently. And always, you know, efficiency first and, and reduce, reuse and recycle are, are tenants of the future better and more uh, sustainable lifestyle and, and businesses and polities that we have to build um, to be attuned to that and uh, always think about the materials throughput and, and be um, as minimally invasive and, and maximally efficient as we can. I think it goes hand in hand with the solar adoption because to m basically make sense of solar power, you really want to tie the load or the demand center, the building, the car, the whatever you're trying to power with the supply that you generate. And so I think we'll be a lot more efficient than the profligate days of the fossil fuel industry. All to say, I don't think the analysis is entirely right that it's a, a moot point, you know, we can't do this. Rather that we should be very careful and look to the prior informed consent of all the communities that are impacted by the process. We should try to make it as sustainable as possible. We should try to make it as efficient as possible and reuse and recycle all the components and materials and build that in up front so that it's a closed loop design process to ensure the, the minimal footprint. But all that said, it's, it's no comparison. You know, if you've ever been to a coal mine or a fracking field or an oil field in Nigeria or Colombia or Australia, as I have, you can't talk about the impacts of fossil fuels over a century in comparison to what we're talking about with the, the, the demand for minerals, for photovoltaics and, and, and the related technologies in the renewable revolution. Uh, you know, for one thing, it's, it's a once through system I think is important, the fossil fuels that is, is a once through system, meaning you dig it up, you destroy the earth, you sacrifice the forests on top of it, you de deplete the aquifers or pollute them underneath the, the fossil fuels, you dig them up and you burn them once and done, and then all that carbon's in the atmosphere forever, or um, well not forever, but cycle through the atmosphere. With renewables, we're talking about digging stuff up, no doubt, and that has a big footprint, but 
you can recycle that. It has that potential at least. It's a reuse scenario. And then the energy that it's taking from the sky comes every day. It's income to the planet. The only kind of income there is. Everything else is an asset that we're depleting when we dig it up. But the solar power itself, the insulation as we call it in the business, that's income every day that we get to spend. And it's a blessing on this earth that we should work out how to use so we can run our civilization safely. How does a person go about running their house on solar energy? So in California, uh, the building code has just been adopted in the last year in 2018 that says that all new homes from 2020 have to be zero net energy. So in other words, if you're a home builder or you're a fixer up or bought a piece of land, want to build a house, you have to build a house that produces as much energy as it consumes, which basically means you need to have solar on it or a geothermal heat pump or some other innovative power production system. And the easiest way to answer your question about how do you run a house on solar energy is you have some solar power on the home and it, the panels, the, the solar capacity, if you will, will produce enough electricity over time that you'll at times be trading it out into the grid. You'll be grid connected but you'll get a credit for what you put out to the grid to your neighbors or the business down the street or whoever consumes that power. Electricity sort of tends to work like water and it flows to the point of use. Um, and so if you've got a home and you're at work and there's no load except the refrigerator in your house at the time that the solar panels are cranking because it's midday on California, you're putting a lot of juice out into the system and you get a credit for all that and then at night when you come home and your solar panels aren't producing and you're pulling power from the grid to run your TV or cook your dinner on your induction stove, you tick down those credits. And under that scenario, we are now required by law for every new home in California to run at zero net energy. It's not rocket science. My house does it. I have an electric vehicle which also gets fueled by my solar power under that system. Uh, you know, we know how to do it. The home builders of California are doing it now at scale, uh, you know, tens of thousands of units annually. And that will be the building standard of America soon because as California goes, so goes the nation and then the world. Uh, and it's, it's really not that hard. Uh, it portends a really different future for the utility system that we built in the 19th and 20th centuries here in New York State actually first time you know around Niagara and Edison and Westinghouse and Tesla and those people playing with AC and DC and all that stuff and and you know God bless them they gave us electricity but they also gave us coal and the burning of it and changed the climate and so we've realized we have to get off that a hundred years later stop burning the coal and what we've realized too is that that probably means moving away from the centralized energy architecture that they built around those coal plants. They were so dirty and polluting that even though Edison initially thought they would all be coal plants in the neighborhoods, you know, one per block sort of thing, they realized that that distributed architecture for coal wouldn't cut it because the pollution locally would be too intense. So instead, he and his business partner bargained with cities and decided to build things out of sight, out of mind, out in the suburbs and beyond and ship electricity long distance on transmission systems into markets to sell light at night on the streets to the towns. And in return, they got an, a monopoly given to them. And then those central station hub and spoke systems, you know, the, the Edison businesses around America became kind of the mental model by which people built out electricity. With the solar power future that we're going to, that system isn't as sensible. I mean, I think there will be a period of transition where we depend on it a lot, but we use solar farms at the end of those long distance transmission lines. Um, and that's fine because they're clean, they're not dirty. But in the end of the day, we're gonna put the power production right next to the power use, because we can. And any piece of copper between supply and demand is a cost. So if your building can produce all the power that you need, why wouldn't you? You know, why would you pay for some off-site provider to ship electricity which is lost at some rate of inefficiency across the wire every time you ship it? Um, 
you know, we have technologies that are available today for photovoltaic roof shingles, but also windows. Every window glass could be producing power for the house behind it. Every sidewalk could be photovoltaic. In the Netherlands, they're building bike tracks out of photovoltaic material. In China, they're building roads, and in Germany and France also, and Japan. Um, so I believe in the future, we'll have the skin of every building, some of the surface of our cities producing power. We'll capture it for uses locally, different loads or demands that we'll apply it to. And the electricity grid will be much different. It'll be just about that arbitrage of electrons from one to another nearby rather than the long distance transmission of electricity over those distances. That's, that's a, a long-winded way to say how you do it is not beyond us. This is not rocket science. We actually do this by the tens of thousand. Bangladesh is employing, is de deploying 50,000 solar homes a month right now. And all those people, they get, the only electricity they get is their solar power. So they're doing 50,000 a month. Of course, they have a different standard of living to the United States, but for them, that's a blessing because it means not burning wood or kerosene or whatever the local air pollution, indoor air pollution alternative is. Um, we, and as I say, in California are doing it by the tens of thousands with new homes and have to by law from 2020 onwards. So not hard, just something we've got to do.